Well, now that we have endoscopy available, we can go in under the same anesthesia, go in with our camera, find that bottle cap very easily. It's sitting right there on the TV monitor with our little uh, graspers that are fed through that same uh, endoscope through that chamber, grasp the bottle cap, pull it out, wake Braxton up, and he's home within two hours. There's no pain medication, there's no um, need for antibiotics, there's no incision, so there's no e collar there's not even an overnight hospitalization stay. And it's just amazing that we have the ability to do this. I mean, when Dad graduated high school, uh, high school, <laughs> vet school, he, they certainly never would have been able to dream that these things would be available standardly, you know, in veterinary medicine at your routine veterinary practitioner, which is really, really very rewarding. Other things that um, are on the horizon or actually presently available today is laparoscopy. And the laparoscope, again, you guys are, may know all, you know all about it even if you're not familiar with the terminology. That is when we have um, surgery performed within the abdomen through tiny little incisions so that you're not making a big incision and exteriorizing whatever you need to work on. You're making a tiny hole and going in with your instrument. You've got a camera and at least one instrument, possibly two, depending on what you need to do. And so you perform the surgery and then you come out. If you need to remove anything, you remove it through that little hole. And this is how if you've got a wife, a mother, yourself, a daughter, anyone that's had a hysterectomy recently can compare that to their mother, wife, daughter, you know, that had a hysterectomy years ago. Years ago, we had to do the open abdominal approach. And they open the abdomen, take the uterus out. Now we have the ability in veterinary medicine, just as we do in human medicine, to do a spay, which is essentially a hysterectomy. We take the ovaries and the uterus, but it's basically what it is. We can do our spays laparoscopically through these tiny little holes, just as women can leave a hysterectomy the same day. I, I really honestly don't know if you stay overnight or not, but I know that recovery time is not nearly what it used to be. There's not the same need for the strong antibiotics or the pain, uh, pain control, and they go home the same day. It's just, it really is amazing what, what we're able to do. Other things that laparoscopy have afforded us is the ability to go into the abdomen and kind of what I call take a peek at what's going on. Um, for example, you're in an examination, I'm checking my time. <laughs> you're in an examination and you, and you feel a mass. There's a mass in that abdomen. You know that there's not supposed to be a mass in the abdomen, but there's nothing that you can do to know what it is unless you get a biopsy. I mean, that's the same as humans. You know, you can look at it all day long. You can even do ultrasound. You can tell what part of the body organ it might be attached to with ultrasound, but you don't know if it's malignant without getting a little piece of it. And in the past, the only way you could get a piece of it, I take that back. You could get a piece non-surgically by doing a ultrasound guided biopsy with a little punch biopsy. It's a very large bore needle. Many times that could be non-diagnostic because you're just getting a bunch of squashed cells on your slide. To get a good piece, you'd have to go in surgically. And you open the abdomen, it's a full exploratory. For something like that, it's pretty big surgery to go through, especially if you've got your beloved 13-year-old dog that has this mass. You don't want to give up on them. Gosh, it could be benign, you know? But to go through that pretty big surgery to find out what that is, is a big decision. Owners, you know, and rightly so, forget finances, forget everything else involved. Do you want to put little Muffin through this at 13 years old when it's mass? I mean, can it, can it be good? Well, it could be. It could be benign. And if we were able to go in there and look with just a little incision, of course anesthesia, but a little incision, look at it with our camera, get pictures, get really close, get a little biopsy, come out, got a nice piece of that tissue, and then you come out and you do one little stitch in the abdominal wall and in the skin and you wake them up and they go home, they're wagging their tail within 45 minutes and ready to go home within an hour and a half. You've got that piece, you've got that knowledge, you know what you're dealing with, and if it was bad, if it was cancer, you know within a few days, but you didn't go through that whole surgery. Little Muffin's not still recovering from this surgery that takes them about 10 to 14 days really to be fully themselves again. So that's, again, you know, it's a bad outcome if it's cancer, but you've got Muffin that can now live knowing what she's got. You can say, well, we didn't do anything invasive. We, we can't fix this, you know, chemotherapy. It depends on what it is. They've got chemotherapy and radiation available, and with a lot of them it's successful, but it, let's just say it's not. 
Muffin still has great quality of life. You know, you found this mass just by chance doing a regular routine six month wellness visit. But we're able to really help these pets a lot more than we used to be able to with the technology that's available. And it's, it's just really exciting. It's very exciting to, to get to be the generation that gets to enjoy all of this. And I think my dad felt the same way. You know, he thought he was lucky to get to cure heartworms and frontline. God, that revolutionized the whole quality of life for animals, you know. So I don't know. You know, if I have a fifth generation, what will they be tell talking about when they stand in front of the Rotary Club 25 years from now? I really don't know. It's kind of neat to think about. But um, that's where we are. And if anybody has any questions about anything else that they've heard about or how things work, I'd be happy to open the floor to any questions. Yes? That's exactly what you should look for, really, is it, a, a commercial food, first of all. I think that you really get into sticky situations when you try to do, it can be done. People can do their own diets with, you know, making their own foods with different vegetables and whatnot. It's very difficult to make that balance correct. So really, I would, this is the, the scenario that I give my clients when I'm in an exam room, and it's much like a pediatrician. I really equate us to pediatricians a lot because our patients can't talk, our patients can't um, fend for themselves, and they can't tell us where it hurts. And just like a pediatrician, our patients' parents are very, very worried about their pet. And just like at the pediatrician's office, I think every veterinarian would tell you a little something different. I know that every time I took my child in with a problem, they told me something different, and I, I was a little forgiving since I understood that that's the same way people feel when they come into our hospitals. But if you, just like a pediatrician will tell a person, you know, you really should feed the peas and carrots, that would be what I would equate a premium dog food, like your science diet, for example. In the life stage that they should be, if it's a puppy, if it's a senior pet, if it's a large breed puppy, um, will they grow, will they thrive on uh, some of the generic diets? Possibly, their coat might not be as well, they might not grow as much or thrive as much. I mean, you would really rather do the premium food. It's worth the money that you spend on it. Now, did my kids occasionally eat the Kraft macaroni and cheese out of the box? Yes. And did they grow? Yes. But when I could, you want to give them what's best. Does that help at all? Okay. Anything else? Yes. Yes. I get that question a lot, and I, I really am not opposed to it at all. I'll tell you why. Um, there are several states, and I think even the UK has banned it for being um, not a good thing. If anyone couldn't hear, that's about declawing cats. Declawing a cat really is removing the last digit. I mean, it's not just taking the nail itself, it's removing the entire digit of the claw so that the nail will not just grow right back. So it's not something to be taken lightly, and it is pretty invasive, and it's permanent. So it's very important to know and absolutely be resolved that that cat is not going to be an outdoor cat at any time throughout its life. If you have to find another home because of illness or you move or something, you've got to have the responsibility to find that pet another indoor home. Because outdoors, without their claws, they're not able to escape. They can't jump over a fence as quickly. They can't defend themselves if they're attacked by a dog, for example. So it is a permanent decision. However, Having said that, I'm not opposed to it because I really do see that when a cat is declawed, many times it greatly increases the bond between them and their parent. If it allows a cat to stay inside where it's a lot safer because they're not scratching children or elderly parents, or even if it is just because of furniture, let's be honest, we can't keep replacing our furniture. I mean, even though that sounds bad, it's just practically, I mean, it's practical and it's true. If you can keep a, pet in, a cat inside because you have done that surgery, if it's done with laser especially, it's extremely um, much less invasive, much less inflammation and pain, and the post-operative recovery is much shorter. I'm not opposed to it at all. 